Now, you may have something called policies, standards, guidelines, and procedures. Those have been around for a long time, and if you're coming from any lower level certifications, you've heard this before, right? So, a policy, standards, and guidelines, they're all kind of different uh, from each other, but they also interact with each other in a variety of ways. For example, procedures. Well, they come from policies, right? We put a policy out there and we say, this is, how you, this is what we need to do. Well, how do we do that? Well, that's our procedures. So that's how they kind of interact with each other. So to successfully develop and implement information security policies, standards, guidelines, and procedures, we have to ensure that our efforts are consistent with the organization's missions, goals, and objectives. And I mentioned that just a little earlier. We have to align ourselves with what the business does. We can't go in there and create a policy that says, no, you can't do this, because that's a critical business process to meet the goals and mission of the business. We can't cut that off. We can't stop that, because now the business can't function. We can't make money. We can't survive. The business is gonna go out of business. So it's, it's not good for anybody, so we have to Make sure that we're, you know, we're, we're playing a balancing act is what it is. We have to meet our goals as security professionals because we have goals in mind, right? We have objectives that we need to meet. I want to lower the risks. I want to stop the threats, plug the vulnerabilities. That's my goals. How am I going to do it? Well, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, but I can't have X, Y, and Z overlap business processes A, B, and C. So some policy types, let's talk about real quick. First one being senior management, could be senior management policy. This is a high level management statement of an organization's security objectives, what it is we need to do. Could be organizational and individual responsibilities. Well, this is what we're going to do. Who's going to do this? Could have our ethics and our beliefs in there as well and general requirements and controls of what we're going to put in place. We could have a regulatory policy. This is highly detailed and concise policies, usually mandated by federal, state, uh, industry, or other legal requirements. So if you think of a regulation, you may want to think of legal requirements. You know, federal and state, city, local uh, requirements they have for your particular organization or your particular company. You could have advisory policy types. Now, these are not mandatory, but they're just kind of highly recommended, right? It's like a guideline. Uh, often has specific penalties or consequences for failure to comply with, though. Now, most policies fall into this category where they're advisory. They just say, this is the way things really need to be done. Now, when it comes to not following a policy in an organization or a company, we could have penalties, consequences, like an acceptable use policy, right? That's an advisory policy for your employees or for everybody. Uh, I know when, when my children started high school, they had an acceptable use policy for the school's computers, right? That's an advisory policy of what they can and can't do, and if they do this, you know, surfing somewhere they're not supposed to, or your employees are on uh, social media, those social networking sites uh, when they're not supposed to be, what could be the consequences? Well, you may get a warning, right? It'll slap on the wrist the first time, uh, suspension the second time, termination the third time, or you could be more stringent, you know, termination right out of the gate, depending on what organization you work for, right? Could have informative policy. That one's probably pretty self-explanatory. That informs, right, an informative policy. It only informs. No explicit requirements for compliance. It's just like, this is what this is about. This is an information policy, not an advisory or regula regulation or regulatory policy where you have to meet these um, or you really should meet these policies because if you don't, there could be consequences. Now, when it comes to security roles, and responsibilities. Whose job is it for security in an organization? What do you think? That's right, it's everybody's responsibility. It's not just mine as a security professional. It's not just the 
you know, chief information officer's job. It's not the IT director's job. It's not the security analyst. It's everybody from the top down. Yes, we need the CIO involved if we have one. We need the IT director involved. We need security analysts involved, the security managers, security professionals, all the way down to our end users. And beyond that, I'll even take it one step further. Any contractors we have, outside vendors, consultants, they all need to be part of our security because they're in the building, they're, they have access to whatever, they need to follow our security policies. And we're gonna talk about that some more too. So every end user is responsible for understanding the policies. We need to make sure that, you know, we can have this advisory policy in place, but do the users understand that? And at the end of this domain, when we talk about security awareness training, we wanna hit that hard. Because you can have the best written policy ever, but if nobody understands it, or they have not been trained on it, but they're expected to follow it, that just, that, to me, it just doesn't make sense. So we need to make sure they understand the policies and then take it one step further and understand the procedures that are going to be applicable to their particular job function and making sure they're adhering to any and all the security controls expectations that we have in place. So we have a policy that says you cannot do any online shopping throughout the workday, right? So that's our policy. Make sure they're adhering to those security control expectations. Don't really have a control in place necessarily as far as a firewall or proxy or something like that, a technical control. This is more of a managerial or administrative control, right? We have a policy in place. That is the control that we have and our expectations of you as an employee is to do the right thing, not get online and do online shopping. That's what we expect. So users must have a knowledge of their responsibilities, what they're responsible for, and be trained to a level that's adequate to help reduce the risk of loss to an acceptable level. We can't be everywhere as security professionals. We try, we could have monitoring, we could have logging, we could uh, have access badges, but, and I'm speaking from experience here, the end users and the customers and everybody else in the organization usually outnumber us as security professionals. It's not like we have one security professional for every 10 users. That's not really cost effective for one, and it just doesn't happen for another. You may have one responsible for hundreds or thousands of individuals out there. That's a big job. That's a lot of responsibility. That's why we need to make sure that everybody is following security procedures, following security policies. You know, let them keep an eye out for wrongdoings. You know, like talked about having a knowledge of their responsibilities and train them. You know, tailgating. What if somebody was trying to come in the door when you're walking in in the morning, but they don't belong there? They don't have their security badge with them that day. You don't really recognize them but they say they work on the fourth floor and you only work on the second floor, so they could be telling the truth. They may work in that building, but what's the policy? And what is your responsibility as an end user? Are you supposed to let them in? Say, okay, have a good day. Or are you supposed to escort them to security, a security professional, so they can do further investigation? Or are you supposed to slam the door in their face? Those are policies, those are responsibilities that we have as end users. If we don't train those end users on the correct procedures to follow our policies, they're, they're going to introduce vulnerabilities, letting people in the building, for example, that don't belong there. They not, they're not supposed to have that level of access. That's just one example. Also for our security roles and responsibilities, we could have specific roles and responsibilities. So who is responsible for what? like security updates, backups. That's gonna be in our policies. We have to say the responsibilities or, or dictate who has the responsibilities. Could have a general responsibilities. You know, who's responsible for security? Again, is it everybody? Just a security manager, security analyst, CIO, CEO, or the security guard? General policies. 
communicated at hiring. This is important. We have to communicate the policies, procedures, responsibilities of that employee when they get hired on. They may need reminders as well. You know, just because you get hired on and you fill out, you know, if, if, <laughs> if you work in a large company, you, you know, you got a packet. It's like doing your taxes anymore. You sit there and you're signing all this stuff. Read through that stuff because they're going to have your security roles and policies and procedures and your responsibilities inside that packet. But you've worked there for a couple of years. You're very good at your job. Maybe you forget those policies, that security policy. You know, you jumped online for 10 minutes and, uh, you know, because you got a text message from your significant other that said, uh, you know, uh, you know, try to go to the grocery, uh, bank card is not working. So you might flip out for a second, right? Jump online for your banking and see what the balance is, see what's going on. You know, is that against policy? Maybe, maybe not. Some organizations have stricter policies than others. But you may not think about it. You may not remember because you signed this stuff two years ago. Now there's an emergency. To you, it's an emergency. So you're trying to, you don't think about that. You're just jumping online real quick because that's habit. That's what you do. So we need reminders. Continuing education and awareness training for employees. Don't just set it and forget it, if you will. We want to set it at the beginning. Let them know what's going on but constantly remind them. And I'm not saying go by their desk every day, stay off social networking. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying every summer, you know, new, new school year rolls around or whatever. Uh, um, uh, maybe in the fall, close to the holidays or right after the holidays. You know, have a, uh, a you know, a refresher course, awareness courses, uh, you know, buy them lunch. Have pizza in the conference room. Hey, we're having security training awareness today. You know, we need you to come in from 11 to 12. Lunch is provided. Come in and watch this seminar. Come in and listen to this speaker. They're going to tell you about the loaded, lo latest social engineering techniques. Right? Just an example. And there's tons of trainers out there that are more than willing to come to your organization or company and do things like that. You may have internal trainers that do this. They may create computer-based training. And now the employees on, you know, at the end of the day, they're supposed to watch an hour video. So they have that continuing education, that continuing awareness. We need to have the verified capabilities and limitations. So we don't want to give people more access to anything than they need to do their jobs. That least privilege we talked about. Could have third-party considerations, and I just talked about this when it comes to our roles and responsibilities. Those vendors, those contractors, all right? They almost always have more rights and privileges than they need. They should have least privileges. This could be a worse, uh, one of the worst things you do inside your organization. You have a contractor coming in, uh, they're working for a month, and they're doing X, Y, and Z, and you give them a domain admin account. Not the best idea when it comes to uh, security and that security posture for your organization. We want to give them just enough rights, just like you would your regular employees, to do their job. Don't give them more than what they need. Have good practices. Security needs to be simple, needs to be relevant and understandable and communicated. Just because we have a policy out there, train people, communicate this policy, let them know what's going on. As an ISO, it is to make it easy and make people understand why that policy, why this responsibility is important, why it's important to them as employees and why it's important to the organization and the company as a whole. Now we have some internal roles and responsibilities, executive management or upper management, whatever label you want to put on them, right? We're talking about the upper echelon here. They have the ultimate responsibility for security breaches and the results of the organization's chosen risk mitigation strategies. That's kind of important because earlier I said, who's responsible for security? And I went on a tangent about everybody's responsible, which is absolutely true. But ultimately responsible is going to be executive management, those C-level classes, if you will, of individuals, your CEO, your COO, your CIO. 
your CFO. They're ultimately responsible, but you're also gonna have a trickle down effect <laughs> because where do you think they're going to get their information? That's right, from you, the security professional or the IT director that you report to, or maybe you report to some HR. They're gonna get that information from somewhere because again, you're the technical expert, you're the subject matter expert on security, not them. So they got their information from you. Now when it comes to you know, litigation or something like that against a company, yeah, they're going to take the brunt because they're ultimately responsible. But again, it's going to trickle down. We have information system security professionals or information security officers, information security professionals. Those are us, right? That's, this is us. Uh, unless you're a CIO or something like that, this we are the information security officer or the information security manager or you know security professionals, right? All synonymous. Um, <laughs> usually when you're walking around with people, that's the security guy, right? That's the computer security guy. They have no idea what your official title is. So they're just gonna call you the IT guy or the security guy. Uh, he's the one that makes the policies and makes us follow the rules, things like that. Now, executive management can only make those decisions if they get good advice coming from us. So we're the ones that they rely on for sound advice and sound uh, guidance. So we have to know what we're talking about. And again, be able to speak the language. We're gonna be responsible for designing, implementing, uh, the management, review of the organization's security policies, standards, baselines, procedures, guidelines that we set out, things that we probably should do. This is what we should do, right? That's a guideline. We're going to set all that. We have to have buy-in for executive management. Again, that's why we have to establish that rapport. Get that relationship between your business entity and the organization as a whole. Get their ear. Get them to listen to you. Now, I'm not saying just feed them whatever you can, okay? But give them relevant information to make sure the company is successful. We could have developers. We may have developers as an internal role. These are our system designers, our programmers. Um, you talk, we talk about software developers all the time, right? They sit there, they develop our applications that we use or our apps for our phones, our tablets, and things like that, right? That's an internal role. We have to think about security when it comes to software development, the software development life cycle. Could have custodians and operations staff. Sure, I'm sure we do. These are the people that maintain our systems. They have internal roles and responsibilities as well when it comes to security. Right? If you have a custodial staff, right, they maintain the physical uh, perimeter of the building, inside and outside, I should say. Right? They keep things clean. They keep, keep uh, everything looking nice. That's a very hefty job, but it's also a very good one for security. I always, these are the people that I always get on my side first as the custodial staff and operation staff, like administrative assistants or secretaries or whatever label you want to give them, because they know the ins and outs of the business probably more than anybody. They're always walking around. They're the first ones people come to to ask questions. They know a lot about the business and or your organization and the ins and outs of what's going on. Think about it, if you have a custodial staff walking around all the time, maintaining the, the heating and air systems inside of your building, uh, maintaining uh, plumbing, electrical work, keeping the grounds clean and safe, they're always moving around. They're gonna see more than anybody because they're, they're always out and about. They're not stuck writing a policy or coming up with a budget for the IT or whatever. They're always out and about. They're seeing things. They could be your first level of defense, if you will, when it comes to security because they're out there. Get them on your team. Other internal security staff, physical security, could go back to the custodial staff. Sometimes they're on one. It depends on how your organization is set up. The uh, security staff and physical security could fall under HR, 
could fall under the IT team. Again, depends on how your organization is and, and how you want to do things. We have data and system owners. They're responsible for information classification, defining and deciding user access. I come up with some data. I come up with a spreadsheet or I come up with the, you know, the latest database. I've designed that. I classify that and say, well, this spreadsheet is, is private or top secret. So once I define or decide on the classification, now I can decide who has access to that, right? Well, that's top secret. Only people with top secret access uh, can access this spreadsheet or this is confidential. So it's not for the public. It's supposed to stay internal. So I, as the data or system owner, I decide that because I created that. We have our end users. They're out there all the time, right? The ones, they call them end users because that's the end of the line when it comes to networking, right? The traffic's coming across, it goes down to a computer. That's the end of the line. So there are end users. They're always on the computers. They have tons of roles and responsibilities when it comes to the organization and security is usually not the first thing that they think about. By the way, that's one thing that we have to think about when we're talking about CISSP. Um, we think differently than everybody else. We are security goal oriented. Most everybody else is not. They're mostly business oriented, like end users. I'm not saying they don't ever think about security, but it's not on the front of their mind like it is ours all the time. They're trying to get their job done. They've got people to report to. They've got bosses and leaders and whatever. And they're saying, get it done, get it done, get it done. And then they got a security guy saying, get it done, but you have to do it this way, right? So we're always thinking about security. They're not. You may have a legal compliance and privacy officer. This one probably falls under HR. They're talking about laws and regulations. And we're making sure that our policies and procedures are in place to follow those laws or those regulations against state, federal, local regulations. If it says, you know, we're a doctor's office, we got laws, we got regulations like HIPAA, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but we have to follow those regulations. And if we don't, we can meet some serious consequences. So we may have legal or privacy or compliance officer making sure that they are protecting the organization and we're doing what it is we're supposed to be doing to make sure we're meeting those laws and regulations. You may have internal auditors. Obviously, that's an internal role. But that's somebody that's going to go around, probably work with the privacy and compliance officer to make sure we're following the policies that we set in place. This is usually not the one, this is not the one person in the organization that everybody wants to invite to lunch because um, I've had to do this. You know, you go in and do an internal audit and you're not really catching them doing something right at this point. You're, you're looking for what's not being done, right? You don't, you know, you, you go into somebody's office and they're following all the policies and procedures that we've set. Well, usually we put the check mark and walk away. We don't pat them on the back, give them an attaboy. But if they're not following the procedures or the policies that we set, then however we're recording it, they get the big red X, right? Now we may have to go to a team lead and that end user, they may be reprimanded somehow because they're not following the policies and procedures that we set out. Or we could be auditing, you know, controls that we have in place, like a firewall an IDS, an IPS, some of those technical controls. Not necessarily administrative policies, but what about technical policies? You know, uh, vulnerability scans, penetration testing. We'll talk about that some more as well. Those could all be internal audits done by these auditors. And then external roles, and we've mentioned these a little bit already. We're talking about vendors and suppliers, contractors, temporary employees they all have to have some type of access into our organization, especially if it's IT contractors, IT vendors, or they need something to do with the information systems that we have. They need to follow our security policies. Uh, vendors, let's say you have uh, a gentleman or, or a lady come every day uh, to stock your vending machines. Well, they're walking in with a, a dolly, right? They got their stacks of sodas or 
box of goodies or whatever that they're going to fill up the vending machine. Um, you know, if they're walking in, do they hold the door for somebody to let them in too? They're just trying to be polite. They're just trying to do their job. They may not even know your security policies. Did you even communicate them? Did you say, hey, you know, when you come in the building, come in the front door so we can buzz you through, uh, you know, this is employee only access or something like that. Let them know, right? They're not gonna get offended. But we don't wanna give them more responsibilities than they've been trained on. And we don't wanna give them more access to our information systems than they need, least privilege. We've got customers, they're external, right? They have responsibilities. Business partners and outsourced relationships. Business partners is a big one because uh, let's say I manufacture cars. I, I, I make cars and uh, your company makes the tires that go with my car. Well, we could have a business partnership there. Well, maybe I want to automate our partnership a little bit. And when I start getting low on tires, instead of me putting in an order and, and sending over uh, a, a big order spreadsheet or database or however it is that you get your orders and then you invoice me, we could have all this automated. I may give you per, uh, you know, certain rights into my infrastructure. You can see, oh, your inventory is getting low. Well, let's auto ship over 500 tires. And then the invoice automatically comes over for it as well. So we can have all of that automated. When we talk about that automation, uh, could be talking about cloud services, could be some outsourced relationships there, but they have to be in our system somehow. Again, least privilege. Don't give them more permissions than they really need to do their job. Now, in order for all of this to do its job, to for security governance, to make sure that we're staying in compliance and following our policies and our procedures, standards, baselines, guidelines that we've all set out. We may have some control frameworks, right? We have a, uh, there's tons of them out there, but we can have frameworks in place and we find the one that meets our organizational needs on how we can do things and what it is that we're going to do. So we have a framework in place to manage this governance or maintain the governance, I should say. We, we really manage it. This just kind of keeps us in line, right? If we have a framework of how something's supposed to be done, then we don't have to come with it up with it on our own. We see the framework and we start merging it together with our organization. And we take the way we do things and make, that frame, make it work with that framework that, that meets our needs. Now, most frameworks are consistent. All right, so a governance program must be consistent in how information security and privacy is approached and how it's going to be uh, applied. It needs to be measurable. All right, the governance program must provide a way to determine progress and, and to set further goals. So if we set a goal and we're meeting that goal consistently, let's try to do a little bit better, right? We talked about evolving earlier, talked about getting better. Let's bump up the bar if you or raise the bar a little bit. So then see if we're meeting those goals. That way we can measure what's going on. We may be standardized. So results from an organization or part of an organization can be compared in meaningful ways. So we can have that standardization. They say, well, you're not meeting the standard. You know, we need to see what's going on and try to raise you up to the standard. It needs to be comprehensive. All right, so the framework that we are going to select, whichever one, uh, needs to cover the minimum uh, legal and regulatory requirements for your organization. And that's what I was talking about earlier. You know, there's all kinds of frameworks out there, but we have to find the one that meets our organizational needs. It needs to be extensible to accommodate additional organization-specific requirements as well. Because we may not find a framework that meets everything that we need, it does need to be extensible, where we can kind of bend it and flex it a little bit to meet our needs a little bit better. And having a modular framework, that's more likely to withstand the changes of an organization because we're always changing, trying to get better. So this way, the, the, the controls and requirements uh, needed for modification are reviewed and they're going to be updated so we could tweak the framework a little bit because we're going to get better we're gonna to have to make our framework a little bit better. So a modular framework would work out a little bit better. So our framework needs to be consistent, measurable, 
standardized and comprehensive and modular. Now, due diligence. You may have heard this term before. They say, well, have you done your due diligence? This is the enforcement of due care policies. We're going to talk about that next. So we're enforcing a due care policy and provisions to ensure that uh, the due care steps taken to protect assets are actually working and they're working effectively. So this is identifying what we need for security, our due diligence. You know, are we protecting our organization? We know we have these risks. Are we doing our due diligence to protect our organization? Are we doing those internal audits like we talked about just a second ago? Vulnerability scans. You know, are we protecting our, are we looking for those weaknesses? Or take it one step further with your vulnerability scans and do a full penetration test. You know, you have a vulnerability scan, you're looking for those weaknesses in systems and your network. Well, now that we found those weaknesses, can we exploit those weaknesses? That's the penetration test, right? We're actually seeing the hole. Now let's see if we can jump through the hole and compromise the network or compromise our systems, right? You can do internal penetration tests uh, on your own companies as long as you get upper management buy-in. You can do your own penetration testing to see where your weaknesses are. You could do it at your home for that matter. Right? I know a lot of IT guys, IT professionals, security professionals, uh, network admins, system admins, they've got uh, quite a few systems at their own homes. I know I do at my home office. I can do an, my own vulnerability scan, my own penetration test to see where my weaknesses are in my own infrastructure. It's just a good stepping stone if you don't feel comfortable doing it in your own uh, organization yet or organization that you work for. And then do care. So exercise the care which ordinarily uh, is prudent and reasonable persons would exercise under the same circumstances. So are you doing what you're supposed to be doing to protect our company, right? Now you may be under legal obligations to do the right thing. So due care is doing the right thing. We do our due diligence, we put something in place, but due care is well, we said we need that control, but are we actually doing it, right? We put this policy in place. That was our due diligence. Now are we doing our due care and following the policy? Are we doing what it is we're supposed to be doing, right? As a security professional, I'm, it's my due diligence to say, uh, you know, we need this security policy. We have this control in place and this, and this is this, and this is this. But it's the end user's responsibility and mine as well to do due care and follow the policy, follow the controls, not try to hack this in systems internally or be a disgruntled employee and put a logic bomb and things like that. We wanna make sure we're doing the right thing. Now next, we're gonna continue on with domain one, starting with compliance.